somehow the labor and capital had to fight and at some point one or the other would be vanquished. There was a belief that their interests were pretty much aligned and it's only starting in 1877 that you see this kind of uh, labor versus capital. One reason that happened is that newspapers were used to talking about war. They had talked about war for five long years during the Civil War. So they got to the point where they understood what war looked like and they understood the idea of two different sides at war. So they started to use that kind of language and that language has kind of stuck ever since. Plus labor and capital changed after, world, after the Civil War. So it really did start to be much more diametrically opposed so that the language that many of us have inherited in the labor movement is an injury to one is an injury to all. And this whole notion that right in the preamble of the mine workers, then in the preamble of the IWW, was the idea that labor and capital would continue to war until one was vanquished. And in fact, it says right in the IWW preamble that labor and capital have nothing in common and that they will war until that happens. So. In 1886, what happened is that a few years prior, there began to be agitation for a uh, national eight-hour law. Now today, you know, we, we look at eight hours as kind of somewhat a norm, even though a lot of people are working a hell of a lot more hours than eight. But what happened in the 1880s is, in, in the 1870s, a lot of those strikes were caused frankly, by uh, wage cuts. Management was doing 10% cuts or 15% cuts in wages after the 1873 depression, so people would go on strike to try to save their wages. In 1886, it was different because the fact that people decided that uh, enough was enough, now was the time to start advancing as a labor movement. So they set a, they set a calendar date of May 1, 1886, back in 1884 and they said over the next two years we are going to organize and we are going to create strikes across America to get the eight hour day for everybody on May 1st 1886. So the clock began to began to tick. Now you, oddly enough the person that called for that was Samuel Gompers and and the uh, the folks from the American Federation of Labor actually is, is precursor and they really set that, uh, that timetable. But they weren't the, the, the big organization at the time, was an organization called the Knights of Labor. Now, this whole kind of ramping up for 1886 really worked. So here's the stats. In 1886, which is often called a revolutionary year, there were 1,411 strikes across America involving 490,000, uh, nearly, nearly 500,000 workers across 9,891 workplaces. Now, you know, you might look at that and say, well, that doesn't sound like a lot. Well, the truth of the matter is, that is a lot, because we have, very, strikes are very rare in America now. And looking back and at that time, that's versus 645 strikes a year before, involving 242,000 workers across 2,200 workplaces. So 1886 was a huge strike year. And all of these workers across America were making a real difference on this whole issue of agitation for the eight hour day. Now, why was it different than that 1887? Like I said, it was about advance. Here in Michigan, we had a huge, huge uh, strike in Saginaw Valley called the 10 Hours of No Sawdust Strike, where lumber workers up and down the Saginaw Valley struck uh, for, uh, for lower hours the year before. The call for reduced hours was part of this overall agitation for the eight hour day, this, all of these strikes. You know, the federal government had passed its own eight hour law saying that, that eight hours was uh, the norm for federal employees. But all these private sector employees and public sector non-federal employees are saying, what about us? And everybody was calling for the same thing, which is lower my hours, but don't lower my pay. So I want to get 10 hours pay 
for eight hours work. Because otherwise, what you're doing is you're reducing hours, but you're taking a hell of a pay cut, which meant that a lot of these people who were living hand to mouth weren't going to be able to make it. Now, like I said, the, the, the AFL was just taking off a fairly conservative idea at that time of only having individual trades organize only the best men, since they were pretty, uh, you know, interested only in men, not women at that point. The Knights of Labor were different though. The Knights of Labor said, almost like the IWW, they said the only people that can't be in the Knights of Labor are bosses or lawyers. Those are the two they left out. And they were fairly non-racialist, even though they, were, you know, they, they weren't there everywhere. But from, from 1884, when this, this strike call went out, to 1886, the Knights of Labor increased from nearly 80,000 in 1884 to 800,000 two years later. Workers across America wanted eight hours, or they wanted reduced hours, they wanted pay increases, and they wanted labor organization. And this was a, this was a big thing, because the fact that nothing that size had ever existed in America in terms of labor organization up till that time. Now, one thing about this is that prior to the Civil War, Workers used to strike and they would wrap it in, we are citizens. It was all about republicanism as they called it back then. It was all about, we too are Americans and therefore we deserve a, a good break. After the Civil War, it was no longer wrapped around republicanism. It was wrapped around, we are anarchists or, or, or we are socialists or we are some other kind of ideological bent. All of them were at that time seen the world ideologically rather than seeing the world as, as kind of citizens. So that national strike target was, uh, was set and then, as I said, thousands upon thousands upon thousands of workers across the United States struck that year. Now some of them actually weren't reducing from 10 hours down to 8. They were reducing, many of them were successful getting it down to from 16 to 17 hours per day they were working only down to 10 or 12 and that was success others it was from 10 or 12 down to 8 but as you can imagine any reduction in hours was was worthy the call at that time that there was a song that was written and the refrain was eight hours for work eight hours for rest eight hours for what we will so this whole notion of the fact that Many men or women, if they were working those kind of hours, never saw their families. Many of them weren't, had no days off or only one day off a week, if that. And therefore, they wanted to be able to see their families, they wanted to be able to use their time for, for other things. Now, the 1886 strikes were, were just unbelievably successful by comparison. Workers were winning all over America, sometimes with strong reaction from government. So riots broke out uh, basically based on uh, police intervention in both Wisconsin and Milwaukee, that area also in East St. Louis, where a, a number of, of workers were killed by police on the, uh, on the picket line or in, uh, during rallies. Now, in Chicago, it became one of the absolute centers of all this strike activity. So a group of Chicago anarchists joined this agitation around uh, the strikes, including at uh, the McCormick Reaper Works, where they would stand up for economic justice and stand up for change by comparison. And here in America, it's not a big thing, but I can promise you across the world in South Africa and in uh, where uh, uh, Peter and Nicole and myself uh, spend some time. Workers' Day is a national holiday where, where is definitely uh, the government recognizing the importance of workers and the importance of uh, labor to their nation. So any questions on any of this? Yes? What's that? Old Kareen declare. Oh yeah. So, so uh, yeah, the, the uh, unbelievably fine writer and anarchist, and she, uh, 
she was a friend and, and supporter of, uh, of the Haymarket uh, folks and, and knew them. Yes, absolutely. Born in Wesley, Michigan. Nice and close. We need a plaque. We need a plaque. Okay, any other questions about any of this background? Well, yes. How many strikes nowadays? You said 9,000 in that year. How many in the United States today? Well, the uh, strikes are at an all-time low in the United States. Uh, we are at the lowest. Last year was the lowest amount of recorded strikes uh, in the history of the United States since we've been keeping strike statistics. Okay. Now, one reason that many of you probably know is that you can't be fired for striking in America, but you can be permanently replaced, which is exactly the same. So that in that way, uh, the uh, boss has a legal right to, to uh, end people's uh, jobs for the fact that they are striking, even though all they're trying to do is make the workplace better. And so uh, in that way, the, the specter of, frankly, strikes and the fact that uh, workers today are probably more scared of Visa and MasterCard than they are of the boss uh, any given time, and the fact that governmental power is still very much on the side of employers. Peter, you had a question? Well, that's it. That's an interesting. Well, and that's an interesting question as to whether or not there, there might be a place in Lansing that would be designated as a worker's square of some sort or even in honor of, of Michigan workers or Lansing workers. Uh, you know, naturally we have a lot of labor history that happened right in this town, whether it be the Lansing Labor Holiday, whether it be all of the various agitation over the years by the uh, United Auto Workers, so it could be a, a variety of things that would be commemorated in that way. Who knows where that location would be, but uh, indeed, some type of uh, monument to workers here in Lansing might make sense. Let's so hand over here. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah. Well, that's, and that, what Tim would argue is that they did know, uh, he said that uh, what he went over, and this is, and, and let me explain, I, I guess, you know, I was raised as a trade unionist and as a radical, I was raised on the fact that the Haymarket martyrs were, were innocent. That no one threw the bomb or that an agent provocateur had thrown the bomb and that it was all uh, planned, set up. Uh, but he, uh, he went through all the trial testimony and he said that if you, if you actually go through the trial testimony, in terms of forensic evidence, he said they don't even have, didn't have a word for it yet, but in terms of there were, there were bombs and that Ling, uh, Louis Ling was a bomb maker. There were bombs in his apartment. He had brought bombs uh, to, uh, uh, to a location that were then distributed. Uh, that August Spies had, uh, was in possession of dynamite and everything else. Now, it, I guess that when Messer Cruz's book comes out, read it, and you can read all the other stuff on, on Haymarket as well. But Messer Cruz actually it, it recently wrote an article that said they were guilty, so what? Okay? And I think what he's trying to say is that this was regarded in America to be a revolutionary moment. And these were men who were revolutionaries. They were not, these were not folks who were trying to have a parlor discussion as to whether or not you know there should be a change in the economic system of America. These were folks who were, were seasoned veterans of European battles over issues of whether or not you can change who actually runs the state or whether the state matters. So in that way, looking back, we, I think, in a very strong kind of innocence kind of point of view, look back and say, well, these guys were innocent. Well, if you look, well, but I mean, I think that, you know, that's what we've come to understand. And what Messer Cruz is saying is, hey, some of them were innocent, and probably some of them were guilty, but does that really matter once you understand what their actual project was? That if their project was truly in the midst of a revolutionary movement and a revolutionary moment, do something 
significant in America that would bring on something uh, uh, not unlike the Paris Commune. The 1877 strikes, it was said right in the lo in papers across the nation that what had happened in Pittsburgh, St. Louis, and, and Chicago was that, that they had established uh, uh, the Chicago, Paris, I mean, uh, Pittsburgh and St. Louis communes. They understood very much what, what uh, labor and capital war looked like in America. And that's, I guess, what I would argue from the historical record. 1886 is a pivotal revolutionary year in America. Okay? It's a revolutionary year. And that decade, probably from 1877 to uh, up until 1886, there is actually a cognizance in America that there can be something different, and then you get strongly repressed by the police and by government, by capital, right? And that there's a long, uh, fr fr frankly, fairly dry period of actual labor victory compared to the kind of victories that they were having in the 1886 moment for the eight-hour day. So any, uh, any last comment or question before I uh, hand the microphone back over? Yes? I got dressed in the dark. <laughs> no, of course, uh, if one wears a red shirt on May Day, it's because that's the proper color on May Day to wear.